Another part of the investigative dashboard is where we actually have a research desk. So I hired researchers, um, and some of them are in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, some of them are based with Arij, with the uh, Arab Investigative Reporting uh, Network. Um, uh, some of them are based in Africa and, and, and such. So these people are people that do company searches and person searches every day. They are really, really skilled at it, you know. Uh, and this is, I mean, you know, it, it might look easy sometimes, like uh, you say, okay, I need a company rec record from Gibraltar, you know. Uh, what, what you have to do is, you know, they don't really, I mean, there's, uh, there's an online da database where you r find just, you know, very, I mean, just, just some data on the company, but you'll never find who's involved with the company, you know, directors and shareholders and such. But if you make a phone call to the registry of companies in Gibraltar, uh, you know, then the person there can send you the records uh, after you send some money into a bank account, you know. Now, imagine our researchers doing this really often, they don't even have to call up the registry there, you know. They just send an email, you know, and it's a trust relationship there, you know, and they don't even have to wait for the money to arrive because they know that we're good for pay, you know, and, and such. So sometimes it's, it's these kind of relationships that help you a lot, and our researchers build this besides expertise in how to actually uh, read company records. And it's, uh, so here, uh, on this side of the investigative dashboard is where we actually have, uh, uh, where, where, where you can uh, actually uh, assign uh, requests to uh, researchers. So for instance, if I click here, new research, it's, it's a bit, uh, it, it changes because of the projector. Um, so I can ask, you know, for instance, I'm interested in a company, let's say, based in Cyprus. So what I have to do here is to fill in the name of the company the country where it's registered, and then give some data on your story. And this doesn't have to be exhaustive, uh, exhaustive data. It can be just, okay, this is a story about corruption in my country. So just, you know, just a pointer. You, you don't have to give us, you know, the information on, you know. Um, uh, we also ask you to give us, you know, the places where you looked for the information before so that we don't replicate, uh, duplicate your work, you know. That would be uh, a waste, waste of time for everybody, you know. Um, so where uh, if this is sensitive or not, and this is for one reason. I mean, if we serve you with the investigative dashboard, um, there's, a, there's a period of time that we give you to use the records, and afterwards we make those records public. So that's, I mean, but you can, uh, you know, so usually we're uh, uh, sitting with the records for six months. If you need more, you tell us. Hey, don't publish those records because I need more to investigate, you know. But the idea is that we want to grow this public face of the investigative dashboard, you know. So we tell you up front, this is what's going to happen with the data. We get it for you, but, you know, after a while, after, you know, six months, it will become public in this uh, uh, search, uh, search engine. Um, so once you, you, you can assign a deadline, you then submit, and, you, you know, then you, you just wait for, uh, for our researcher to send you the records. Now, the trick here is that if you ask for this company from Cyprus, and our researchers will see, you know, that the company in Cyprus is owned by the uh, company in Panama, that is owned by a company in the Seychelles, that is owned by a company there and there, they will go after those as well. So they will send you the whole package, you know. And sometimes this is, um, this is really costly, you know, and uh, we mostly have funds, uh, funding right now from Open Society uh, and for, from Google for, for, for some of this data. Because, for instance, to get a company record from Delaware costs $50. And imagine, you get that for $50, just to find out that the company in Delaware is owned by a company in Cyprus that costs 10 euros, that is owned by a company in BBI that costs another $50, and so on. So it can add up quite a bit, quite a bit, you know? So this can be a, a, a costly process, but we do have the money to, to serve you. So that's a very important component to this that, you know, we want to, because e even if some journalists are very, very good researchers, they like, they like the money, you know? And so that's another problem that we try to solve. So you can identify also what a, what a person owns. So you can give us a, a name, the name of a person, you know, first name, last name, and you know, some data again, some details, and then aliases if there, if there are any, and, and such. And we'll uh, do our best uh, to, to do the searches to find out if that person owns companies anywhere in the world. No, no, this is free of charge. This is so the service, the, uh, it's, it's a service for uh, journalists and activists, and it's, Pro bono, it's, it's free of charge, so we, we don't charge you nothing. Um, now, I'll, um, I'll explain a bit how we actually work 
So what a researcher does when he or she gets your request? Uh, so basically, for instance, if you ask for a name of a person, uh, we start our research uh, at the level of databases of databases. Uh, this would be databases such as the one that I'll show you right now, such as this one, uh, Mint Global. Uh, it logged me out. Let me try to see if I can. Uh, if I can connect. So yeah, so this is uh, a database um, that indexes, you know, company information from all over the world. The problem is this is very expensive. Uh, we're paying, you know, I think right now we're paying about uh, thirty to forty thousand dollars a year only for this database. So this is for most journalists, you know, it's, it's something that they can't can't really touch. Um, now, for instance, my access right now with, uh, with, uh, with this database is through Stanford University where I, I used to you know, be a Knight Fellow, but we also have paid access at uh, uh, the uh, ID level. So um, now here you, know, you can input the name of a person. <laughs> you can actually search for contact. Contact means uh, obviously person. And this database um, is, is very, very powerful. I'll, I'll try to show you if the internet works well, um, what this uh, database does. So I'll search for this guy, for instance. Uh, he's, he's a big, big investor you know, in uh, all sorts of uh, countries, including Asia. He's from my country, from Romania. So it's a, it's a bit. Uh, so now, now it searches for this across many registries of companies, data being indexed by Mint Global itself, by the database itself. And we'll see what, what it gives us, you know. And sorry, it's, it's a bit slow, the internet. Uh, so it found Mr. Uh, Frank Timish. And let me uh, pick the first hit. So it will find not only the companies where the, uh, this person is uh, uh, involved right now, but past companies, past directorships, shareholdings, and, and such. Um, so you see, you find here, like, and you can unfold this, you know, companies that uh, this person was involved, uh, is involved with, and then if we go, when it will load, uh, it will give us dormant companies, companies that the person used to be with, you know. So this is, uh, well, it, it loads kind of. Yes. 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 So the idea is when you ask us to do research, this is how we start our research. It's not only mid global. I'll show you. There are a bunch of others that are also very, very expensive. But usually I do, I start with mid global. Uh, some of my colleagues use another interface to this database that is called Orbis. Uh, some of my colleagues start with LexisNexis, which is also a database that indexes, you know, the world when it comes to companies and also court cases and other 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 things. So, the search engine uh, on the dashboard only searches information that has been indexed on the dashboard. It doesn't search. It, it would be illegal, uh, you know, to, to do searches here, you know. So yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But uh, although I mean, it's it's kind of interesting because um, Mint Global. I mean, so it's it's not quite loading here. I mean, it's it's working, but it's very slow. It, it's a big file to you know to download. But uh, Mint Global, you know, gets data, gets their data from registries of companies across the the globe. Some of these actually <laughs> are not supposed to give all the, their information because they're you know subsidized by public money and um, they should uh, and, and they charge their citizens for data you know uh, so I'm, I'm not sure what kind of deals are between mean global and this uh, this databases these local registries of companies but there's, there's something going on um, now this being said this is really 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 useful because what mean global does so you search for a name of a person and you find and this will load, you'll find that the person has, for instance, a company in Liberia, and a company in Australia, and a company in the UK, and a company there and there. And what you do then is you go to the local registries of companies to actually get uh, the, the records, the actual records. So you can't use these records directly in your reporting. 
This is just an aid for the investigative reporting, you know. But it points you out where to look for, especially when you're looking for persons. But it's also, I mean, in many cases, you have the name of a company and you don't know where that company is from. You just have the name, you know. So you input here the name of the company and you might, you know, get the result, you know, that, oh yeah, the company is based in Singapore and then, or in Hong Kong. And then you go to the registry of companies of Hong Kong and search for, and so it's, it's always this kind of process where you start with a company name or a person name, you run into, you know, you start with Mint Global or LexisNexis or whatever other um, indexers of databases. From there, you extract new names, new company names. You come back here with those names. So let's say I find out uh, that Mr. Frank Timish is involved in a company in Liberia, and there I get the company record from Liberia, and there's a second person in the company, you know. I get that name. Of course, I also Google that name, you know, obviously. But I, I get that name, and I come back to Mint Global and put that name in, you know, to find out if that person is actually involved with companies worldwide, you know. And then I do the same, 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 you know. So is this sometimes it's what what it looks like an uh, infinite loop, you know? If you just uh, uh, if if this would low, uh, load would be would be quite uh, quite interesting. But um, this also uh, shows you the business circles of these people, you know. So it gives from this from this interface right here, it tells you that Mr. Frank Timish is linked to these other guys, and there are uh, there's the first degree, you know, second degree of uh, se separation, third degree, and, and such and so on. So those are really really good pointers. So for instance. Let's say you investigate the Prime Minister of Malaysia, Najib, you know, and you want to, to find out if, uh, you know, uh, his family is involved in some businesses, you know. And you, you'll, you'll find from uh, databases like Mint Global, you know, who are the persons that are closest in, term of, in terms of business to Mr. Najib. And then you go around that and you investigate. So, uh, yeah. So this is, sorry, it, it doesn't load. Uh, another database that is really, really cool. Uh, that we're using, but it's, it's again quite expensive. I mean, it's about a thousand dollars a month. It's uh, and some of you probably used it. It's called LexisNexis. Uh, this again uh, indexes lots of company data from all over the world, and it's interesting, you know, because um, for instance, there there are really interesting differences between Mint Global and LexisNexis. Although sometimes it's the same data, the way they index the data is different. So, for instance, with LexisNexis, I can get you know all the Nepalese citizens who own companies, uh, companies in Swi uh, Swi Switzerland, for instance, or in the UK, all of them. So I can get a list of everybody who opened a Swiss company, you know, from Nepal, or from Indonesia, or from Malaysia, or from. And this can be a good start, you know, for investigative work, you know, because you might find in the list of names. So you can do these citizenship-based searches using LexisNexis and the databases that are uh, that are indexed here. So with each database, you can be creative and you can do lots of uh, stuff, you know. Uh, and of course, if you combine these databases, that is really, really powerful. That's where the power lies, you know. And then, of course, you go from company records to court records to various others. Um, and this brings me to another part of the investigative dashboard. And this is where it says visit databases. So here is where we actually index databases from around the world where you can get data, you know. So this is, if you want to, to do it yourself, you can just go here and say, okay, so I need this uh, company information, you know, this, uh, I, I need information uh, on a company from Abu, Abu Dhabi, you know. This is the registry of companies in Abu Dhabi. Of course, you'll have to deal with the registry to pay to whatever. In, in many cases, you know, and this is, uh, this is really, really interesting across the world is that many of these registries are free of charge, actually. You just got to, got to know either the local language to be able to search them, or you got to know how they structure their, their data. So if they're free of charge, they're also probably indexed with the investigative dashboard, you know, because that's, it's legal you know, to, um, to index them. You know, when we initially, for instance, scraped the Panama Registry of Companies, uh, which is free of, of charge, you know, but uh, we indexed it the first time in, in about 2008, 2009. Uh, we scraped it, you know, and the, the thing was that the Panama government got really angry at us. What, why, why, why was that? It was because, you know, I mean, what the registry, what the official registry provided was you could search the registry only by the name of a company. But very often our investigative work starts with the name of a person. So we started looking for names of persons after we re-indexed the same information because it's, it's really easy to create new search options on top of data. You know, you can do lots lots of uh, things with data. 
So we created uh, our very good friend, um, Deno Huygen, who's a British hacker. He created this you know, parallel registry of companies of Panama, where we input, for instance, the names of presidents. And we found lots lots of stories just there. You know, because we didn't know what were the companies that were run by the president, you know, I don't know what country of Romania. Or, but by using you know, uh, the power of re-indexing information, you know, that was all, all revealed. And that led to really um, interesting uh, exposés. So here is where you can filter by, by country, you know, uh, and uh, there's obviously global databases and uh, local databases, and all, all you can search for, uh, let's say, Panama. <coughs> and, uh, you know, it will filter the databases. If the internet would work, it would uh, do it automatically, filter. But you, you get the idea. I mean, the idea is that this should work right now to, uh, to give you the, the databases in, uh, in Panama. Um, another part to the investigative dashboard that you can use uh, as well is, OK, so let's say uh, the investigative dashboard partially solves the problem with indexing information, with find, finding information, processing it, indexing it, alert systems, and all that kind of stuff, pattern recognition. Um, but we also need to visualize that information. So um, I, we created this, uh, this tool that um, is called VIS. Uh, visual investigative scenarios. Actually, VIS in my language in Romanian means dream. This is why I named it VIS. You know, it's, it's kind of, I, I thought it's cool. Uh, so VIS, so uh, it's a tool to visualize the information that you got uh, via the investigative dashboard. Now, VIS is also, it's on, uh, uh, on GitHub, and it's actually, uh, so because of this, thank you here, this thing, you know, it, it kind of changes the, the image. Maybe, wait. Oh, okay. OK, um, so um, this is very, very easy to, to use. Uh, this, um, I designed this with the investigative reporter in mind that doesn't have any tech knowledge, but needs to visualize networks. Because you, you know, in the course of your research, you come across many names of persons, of companies. You know, and I usually start on a piece of paper you know, and I design this guy is connected to that guy, to that, per, uh, to that company, to that. But over time, you know, this grows and grows and grows. So. Um, uh, this allows you to actually um, uh, visualize this in a very, very simple manner and to create these embeddable uh, VCs, these visuals that are embeddable like iframes. And I'll show you <coughs> how, how it works. It's uh, actually quite, quite easy. So I'm, uh, you, you create an account here. You can even put a fake email, fake whatever. But if you lose your password, we won't, won't be able to give you back the password. But you know, I mean, you can just create a completely anonymous account. Um, so you, you start you know, with, a, with a black canvas. It's like this. You know, and you see you have a plus sign in the corner. So it's really intuitive, I think. And here is you know, where we worked with programmers and designed this um, tuned to the investigative reporter's needs. So we defined in, in the system only the entities that we know we work with. So you see the, here, people, business, organization, lawsuit, government, asset, and brand. And each of these has some subgroups. So for instance, in investigative reporting, when you refer to people, it's either, uh, and uh, especially when you, when you refer uh, to people in companies, in commercial companies, they can be a person who's the, the owner of the company or a proxy. So we define proxies as well inside the system. So let's say, you know, I put a person here. Uh, let, let's put my name here. Um, I can add, you know, the location of this person. I can add more details like the website of the person, photographs, whatever, you know, lots, lots of stuff. But let's just uh, add this entity. So once I click add entity, I have myself here. Uh, I'll, I'll have to sell, save the project, you know, to give it, uh, give it a name, save this layout. Uh, it be okay. So. Uh, this is, you know, uh, this is just the beginning of the visualization, and I, I will actually go to a visualization that is already done. Uh, so let's, let's say, let's this one. Uh, so this is, you know, uh, what you see here. I, I, even in this one, even if we don't have many, many entities, it's kind of a mess, right? You can't export this to your website just like this. So this is, you know, in this stage, this is for your background research. 
is for your own use, where you know, okay, so yesterday I left my research at this name at this company, and I want to follow up from there, you know. Um, but what you can do when you want to export this, you can export bits of it. You can export, you know, so for instance, you can isolate entities, you know, uh, collapse tree, and I have just this bank, for instance, that I visualized here, and then I just choose this bank to be connected to this guy. This is actually a, a, an FSB officer that was laundering money for Putin's cousin. And I want to show that this guy is connected to this company, and, and so on. So now I can save this layout, and this I can export, you know. And if you look at um, the website, the w this website, many, uh, many have uh, chosen to make their uh, VCs public after they publish them. So I don't know. This is from Armenia. It's a visualization. It's a VIS from, from Armenia. It should load. For some reason, it doesn't load. Maybe it's because of the. Oh, okay. So it, this projector just changes, you know, the, the the whole layout here. So okay. So this is the vis done by our colleagues from Ar Armenia, and as you can see, they used different types of icons, you know. So this is uh, embedded with vis. You can change your vi uh, visual style. So, for instance, uh, if I have this one, uh, let, let's take the one that was. Let's see. Expand. I can expand back, you know, and then I can choose various themes here that I want to, to use. So this is a bullet theme, for instance. So at, at the this level, we also cooperate with artists that create that create these uh, icons, and we'll uh, we're constantly inputting new uh, new icons so that you can visualize uh, information in your own way. Um, now this um, will soon have a new a new option where if you choose to make your this public and for instance let's say you visualize this uh, this company here it's called SU888 uh, so this was done by me in Romania this this now if someone else let's say in Ecuador or in Malaysia uses this and visualizes a different business scheme but this company th this same company will pop up then the, the authors of these VCs will get an alert on, only if you made it public. So this is exactly to help with advancing investigative reporting in, in knowing that the same company was covered by someone else. And maybe you want to talk to those people you know, and to cooperate. So it's a way to ignite more cross-border reporting. And it's, uh, it's, it's a way to actually you know, improve your work, uh, I'm, I'm hoping. Um, now, besides this, you know, uh, what we don't do at, uh, at this is we don't store uh, uh, your documents. So, for instance, uh, with each, each of these links can be actually based on a, on a document. Um, now, I'll show you. So, if I say that this person owns this company, you can put behind that relationship a document that proves that, which, when you export the VIS to your website, that's going to be visible to the people uh, consulting your VIS. And this is for, for various reasons. So VIS has multiple uses. So it's one for the back end, you know, for your own research purposes. Uh, the other one is for the front end, you know, to uh, actually be able to vis vis visualize information. Uh, but it's also to take the burden out of the text. I mean, the, you know, investigative reporting can be very dry. So if you say that this person owns these 18 companies and you enumerate 18 companies, Nobody will read that, you know. I mean, that, that's going to be a waste of time for everybody. But you can embed the vis showing, you know, keeping that information in because the names of those companies are crucial, you know, are amazing. Actually, you, you know, I, I can give you examples, you know, of stories that started for me from points that I didn't expect the story to start. So, for instance, I was uh, investigating this uh, formation agent. This was back in 2010. Uh, he was based in Bucharest, and he established lots of uh, offshore companies for politicians, dirty politicians, dirty businessmen. Most of them are in jail. He's in jail after our reporting. We went undercover. We approached him. Long, long story. But when we reported on his network of companies, the companies that he established, uh, most of them were based actually in New Zealand, uh, we came across a report by the Canadian Intelligence Service, which is public on the web, which mentioned a company called Tormex Limited. Now, Tormex Limited, what we knew was that it was established by the same group of guys, by this formation agent. But we didn't know uh, much besides what was in the intelligence report. But we put, put it in our story because the intelligence report said that the company was used by the Sinaloa drug cartel to launder money. 
So that was interesting. It was a, was a side thing to our view. We just said, among the companies that they established is this Tormex. Now, we visualize that. We put you know, the documents and all this. And next, I get a phone call from a guy in uh, Romania, actually, a small businessman, who tells me, hey, uh, you reporting on this company called Tormex Limited, right? I said, yeah. Well, do you know that the, this company stole from me half a million dollars? And I was like, well, this is strange. I mean, the company is laundering money, well, la money laundering for the Sinaloa drug cartel, one of the most powerful cartels. Why, why would the company steal money from this guy? So the guy, what he was doing, he was, uh, was, he was importing these uh, tires, these industrial tires, you know, for industrial tractors, for mining vehicles and stuff. And he would always send the money to, uh, to buy this. Uh, he was buying these tires, you know, from Belarus and from Russia. And he was always asked by this group uh, in Moldova to send the money in different offshore bank, bank accounts. And the last amount of money, and this is what happens very often between criminals, they scam each other. So he made the first order for $50,000, he got the tires, he made another one, 100000 and so on. And when he got to half a million, he didn't get nothing, you know. So this is how it works in this world, right? And the guy was very angry, you know. And it turned out that he filed a court case against the people that told him to use this company's bank account. And the bank accounts of this company were in Latvia, actually. And the police in Moldova subpoenaed, as a result of his complaint, subpoenaed the banking records from Moldova, looking for that, just that transaction, the half a million, to prove that, yes, indeed, he sent the money, and to indict those people that told him, because he had the email exchanges and all that and all that. Now, in this way, I was able to go to court in Moldova and to access all those, uh, all those banking records regarding Tormex Limited, but my interest was to see how Sinaloa was <laughs> using this company in order to launder the money. And it was about uh, a bit more, I think, than $700 million that went uh, over a period of two years uh, through the uh, uh, banking of this, of this company. So that, you know, that was a story just because we mentioned in an initial, in initial story this company to called Tormex Limited that meant nothing at first. So this is why it's really important. Don't waste information because lots of times, and I'm, I'm working with lots of investigative reporters that gather so much data during their investigative process and they end up using 1% of that because only that is the story. And it's true. I mean, you're looking for the, for the best story that you can get out of data. But don't let the data to waste, you know. Index it, you know, do something with it. Put it on a, on a website, you know, do something because that might be very useful to other investigative reporters. And uh, trust me, I mean, Sitting in your computer, that data will not do you any good, you know. But if you share it in, in some way, you know, on the web or something, you might get new stories uh, out of that same data, you know. Someone might call you, just like the Romanian businessman and, and such, you know. So this is really important, you know, to use tools like this or other tools that allow you to visualize information and to index information, and, you know, because this can lead to more investigative reporting. Um, <coughs> so I'm not sure how much time we have. So it's like this session is... It's still 4, 4, 30. Okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, so these are basically the parts of uh, the, the investigative dashboard, you know, the, the four, four main parts. Um, now, um, our main programmer working right now with this, uh, uh, Fred Lindbergh, uh, Pudo, it's his, uh, his online nickname, um, he's actually developing more tools inside the investigative dashboard. And the idea is, again, to create especially on this pattern uh, recognition side, uh, to create tools that, you know, you, that investigative reporters can use in order to start new uh, investigative work. You know. And that means, you know, again, uh, pattern uh, rec recognition, this is, I, I really believe in that, because there's a finite um, uh, number of ways to do crime. So once you identify all the ways to do crime, you know, and once you input that knowledge and you combine those patterns, you know, between them via, you know, uh, via an, uh, artificial intelligence, then you get really, really, really powerful with your reporting and you can, you know, find um, uh, new names and new, uh, to actually write new reports. Um, okay, so I, I don't just want to, to talk about this. If, if you have questions uh, at this point, like any question about the investigative dashboard, about the uh, investigative process, uh, yeah, I, I'd be happy to, to answer. When you set up an alert for a person, is there a certain format for the name that we, we should follow? Uh, no, uh, actually, uh, no, there's, there's no, no format. So you can uh, uh, set up an alert on any kind of 
you know, wording. Uh, I mean, you know, a company name, a, a person's name, even a phrase, if you want, you know. So it's, uh, there's, no, there's no requirement there. And the idea is to keep things as simple as, as possible, you know. Um, now, when it comes to the entity extraction, you know, I mean, lots of this data can be uh, imported, you know, in CSV format and stuff, so that's going to be, you know, data that is curated, that is cleaned, you know, and that's, that's a, a um, and that's, you know, I mean, sometimes that is, uh, that is easy. And for instance, with the Investigate Dashboard, what we use is uh, data uh, ex extraction, you know, in various languages, which is really hard. I mean, if you look like at initiatives such as um, Document Cloud, you know, uh, they, uh, Document Cloud, um, you know, has a, a really interesting uh, entity extraction function, but it only works well with English, Spanish, Italian, and French, you know. And, you know, with other languages, it's, it's, it's poor, you know. So what we're trying to do with the investigative dashboard is to actually improve this entity uh, extraction capacity across other alphabets, other languages, you know. So we deal a lot with Cyrillics. We deal a lot with really strange alphabets like, you know, like uh, the Georgian alphabet or the Armenian or, you know. So, uh, and of course, we would want, you know, to expand to uh, languages here uh, in, in Asia, you know. Uh, and, you know, our, uh, we have a really good tech team right now working on this, you know, and this is a, a serious problem because you want to make the most out of, uh, out of documents, you know, and lots of times, you know, I mean, even your, your Google searches are limited because you don't understand, you know, a document and lots of those documents are images and, and such, so there's, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm actually curious, um, how many of you uh, use databases and what kind of databases uh, are you using in your, in your research? Um, yeah, we use uh, we use Orbis quite a lot. Uh, I mean, the only thing is it's quite hard to get. It's, it's expensive, <laughs> so uh, um, and uh, Lexis as well, Lexis Nexus, uh, open, open corporates a lot as well, and the um, the government ones like the registry company registries all the time. But you, you scraped a lot of the information off those, so it'd be better just go to the dashboard instead. So. All this, so you have to go with the Investor Dashboard and Open Corporates and Ming Global and or Orbis. It's the, the same thing actually. Lexis, Nexis, and such, and then you go to the local level. But one thing to keep in mind, especially with the local level, is in many countries, for instance, you, you take the Czech Republic, you know, or you take my country, Romania. A lot of information is available online. In the Czech Republic, for instance, you know, it's free of charge. In Romania, you have to pay a bit of money to get the records. But those records are not everything you can get. So a lot of uh, our investigative reporting came not, uh, I mean, started with the online searches. Well, say, for instance, that we identified that the, the nowadays head of state of Romania, you know, uh, has lots of money that he got from a bank because he rented out this, uh, this place, you know, in this city in Romania to this bank, you know, for the bank's headquarters. Um, now, the thing is, if you check online the, the companies, you know, you find the persons involved and all that. But if you actually go to the registry, you go offline and you go to the actual office, or you call at least, um, you'll get, you know, attached to the company records, lots of other records, like the rent contract. So you find exactly the amounts that the company pays for renting that particular space. You find the, the data on previous owners of that same space, you know. So you, you, find, you find, you know, if the company uh, borrowed money, uh, you know, you, you find lots, lots of uh, information that is not available online. And that is crucial because lots of times we track down offshore companies via these records that were attached to uh, a company record. So, for instance, for years we tried to prove that um, the former regime in Egypt, you know, was connected to some really questionable businessman in uh, Eastern Europe. And we tried, you know, and we tracked down companies and all. It was not all, uh, after, uh, I mean, but when we actually went offline and we went to Albania to the registers of companies and Romania and uh, 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 other countries, Ukraine and such, that we got, you know, because attached to the company records were, you know, records of offshore companies that were used by the regime where they actually said, this is my company, so, uh, you know, I'm allowed to make this money transfer right now. So they recognized that, you know. But if we would have gotten just from the register of companies of the offshore haven, you know, the, the, the records, we would have just gotten the names of some lawyers. But these are records, so sometimes you've got to go in circles, you know, and to think about, okay, so this is a company established by this guy, you know, in this, you know, uh, haven, uh, you know, uh, oh, offshore haven. So where is this guy conducting business? If he's conducting business in Romania, 
There's got to be, for instance, a record uh, showing that the company, the offer company is owned by him. If he's conducting business in Serbia, it's the same, Ukraine. In most countries, because he has to do financial deals. He has to pay, you know, for establishing a local subsidiary, you know, in a bank account. He has to create that bank, bank account. And all that is attached to the offline record, you know. And that's where you find amazing, amazing uh, uh, data. So that's, you know, the and yeah, just the other one when we use a lot is court records when we can get hold of them because um, sometimes the, com the, the company records may show a nominee director or a nominee shareholder, but in court they've got to actually say I represented the company on this day doing this deal. Um, and funny enough, actually uh, Frank Timish, he's actually in court in London right now, as well. I could tell you the details <laughs> later if you want to. Yeah. Um, uh, anyway. Yeah. We actually reported, I, I reported, uh, my last story on Frank Timish was with the Financial Times, actually. Uh, it was, uh, you know, on uh, um, some companies that, I mean, he scammed some people of some money, so uh, maybe the court record is re related yeah. to that, so that could be. But um, coming to court records, indeed, court records are crucially important when, when you want to track down companies, you know. So, for instance, we, uh, I was tracking down this huge, huge scam uh, in Eastern Europe that involved money laundering in the tune of $20 billion. And I knew that a guy was behind this scheme, you know, but he, he's so clever, you know. He, he's now in jail, you know, since like uh, so August. But he was really, really clever in what he was doing. We even interviewed him, and he was always denying, you know, every, any connection to these offshore companies and stuff. He, he's actually established lots of companies in the UK, you know, mm -hmm. uh, these Scottish LPs, you know, and, and other, uh, other type of companies. But he made a huge, huge mistake. This is one of my latest stories that I published like two weeks ago. Uh, it's called, so his name is Platon, Vyacheslav Platon. At some point, he, um, his money was, uh, uh, so some of his money was stolen by this other guy. And what he did was he filed a court case, so he loaned the money to this guy, about six million US dollars, and he filed a court case, you know, uh, actually I'll go to our Romanian website because we embedded the documents there. Uh, he filed a court case where he says in the court case, this offer company belongs to me. And I gave the loan to this guy via this offer company. And this is my company. And this is blah, blah, blah. You know, so uh, let me check and I'll show you. So he gave, he gave up all the information on the offshores that he would never give up. But because he, he had to, he had to recover the money. And he couldn't, uh, you know, in front of a judge, he couldn't establish a relationship between him and the money without saying, OK, yeah, this money were in this bank account belonging to this, um, offer, uh, to this offshore company. But the offshore company, look, it's mine. So that's, this is, you know. So he attached, we actually used document cloud to, to embed this. There was a, a, a court case that he filed in the uh, uh, southern district of uh, Florida, in, in Miami, basically. And yeah, again, the internet <laughs> is not uh, working with me. But th this is the record here, the complaint. And in this complaint, he recognizes everything. And we used court records many times to prove relationships between people. And because lots of times, you know, oligarchs fight, uh, fight, uh, fight each other, you know. And again, <laughs> I, I, uh, so once I was investigating a case um, where these this, uh, American companies took over lots of industrial assets in uh, uh, Eastern Europe. And, but we knew that the American companies are just fronts. But we just couldn't prove it, you know. We knew that there were some Russian oligarchs behind them. And at some point, these Russian oligarchs uh, uh, started a, a fight, commercial fight. So they filed, uh, you know, this uh, lawsuit. One, one of them filed a, a lawsuit in a commercial court in London, actually, where you know it, it was like uh, they wrote a statement, a complaint of about like 160 pages, where they would give up all the details of the transactions and how they bribed people and how I mean everything was there, you know, because they didn't uh, and all that was indexed via LexisNexis, you know, which was like wow. So. so you know, you work hard to get such data, you know, and, you, and then it's all there told by the, 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 the criminal, you know, which is like the best, you know, when, when you can quote them as saying, you know, that, yeah, this company belongs to me and I gave the bribe, you know, because he filed it with the court, so, you know. So, yeah, so court records, yeah, are, are indeed very, very, very useful. And what we do at the level of the investigative dashboard, and it's not only with court records, but also company records, is we try to keep ourselves updated with what's new. There's more and more company databases and courts that are open, you know, as part of this open government uh, things, you know, and, and stuff. Uh, so it's, it's really crucial to find out, you know, very quickly, you know, if a new database was opened up, because then you can mine it, you know, and you can combine it to, with other searches, and that gives you a lot of investigative reporting. And this is only growing, because there's more and more data out there that, that can be used uh, by us. And in, in truth, you know, we are very few. So, for instance, at my, uh, at Rice Project is uh, our, uh, uh, Center for Investigative Reporting in Romania, 
but uh, my uh, my uh, big network, the uh, OCCRP, is uh, is actually comprised of this, all these centers for investigative reporting from uh, many many countries, and we always get data from all these countries. You know what's new, what what database is open, what we can scrape, what we can you know, and we have you know uh, always this information and that uh, you know helps us uh, in our investigative work, and we are not enough. I mean, there's so much that we could do right now. Th there are so, so much, you know, so it, there's, there's a lot, a lot of work. And we're basically cherry picking right now, you know. Okay, so this story looks better and this story, but they're all amazing stories, you know. So we wished we'd be more and I wish you will help, you know, with, with this investigative work because there's, there's a lot to be done and the data can, can give us, you know, a, a, a very good head start, you know. Yeah. Uh, please. So the, the question was, how do you get, uh, how do you know that uh, this court case was filed, you know, and uh, in the case of Platon? So in this case, you know, again, we use the paid for database, which is called PACER, which uh, indexes, you know, U.S. court cases. Most U.S. court cases are indexed there. And what I do regularly, I have my list of suspects and I go to PACER and I, you know, search there and, you know, I find. And uh, I have, and PACER, PACER. Pacer, it, it's a very important database. It's, it's not as expensive as the others. Uh, I mean, you can buy company records for, you know, I mean, the maximum that you can pay for a, uh, for a court record is $30. So even if it has 10,000 pages, you'll end up with paying $30. Although a page, I think it's three cents, but then it just stops at $30, you know. And this is really, really important because um, uh, uh, Pacer and many others, you know, many other local uh, uh, databases that provide court information. So this provides court information from uh, all over U.S., you know. And what we noticed is sometimes, you know, so let's say a country asks the U.S. to, uh, you know, to send back, you know, this guy who stole, you know, this, this money, you know, to uh, ex ex extradite him. And usually the country, you know, files, uh, files a court case because this is how things work in the U.S., and they need to attach proof to that, you know. And the proof is considered secret in the country that sends it, but being attached to this court case, it, it's all public. So you can consult it here and you can use it in your reporting because it, it's public. But you see all sorts of records marked secret, you know, and, you know, private and all, all sorts of other, uh, other things. And of course, the law enforcement in your country doesn't want you to publish those. But because they are public, because you get them from here, you know, you can just write great stories with, uh, with those. So this is, again, the difference because what we also do is we analyze laws in each country, not only transparency laws and uh, app access to information laws, but also, you know, uh, you know uh, laws, of, you know, when it comes to filing these, uh, 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 you know, these requests, you know, like for uh, information, you know, country A asks for information about the company from co uh, country B and stuff. And we actually, at the level of the investigative dashboard, we also train uh, uh, police, you know, um, even Secret Service officers, you know, so we're conducting these trainings where you, we, uh, which are actually quite interesting, where we have together journalists, activists, secret service agents, and, you know, some other law enforcement, like police or whatever. We conducted, for instance, an interesting one, like three days uh, workshop in Prague, where we had, you know, Czech Secret Service activists from uh, TI, uh, Czech Republic, you know, and journalists and, you know, some police. And we split them into teams, and for three days they mapped out, you know, all sorts of ownership in Prague, like all the, uh, uh, for instance, all the casinos, small casinos, there is full, full of casinos in the center of Prague, and uh, exchange houses and all sorts of stuff. And, you know, because these were mixed teams, you know, they worked very well uh, together, and everybody had, had a, you know, a, an angle to the, to, the, to the story. But to their surprise, you know, the secret agents found that some of, some former secret agents own those exchange houses, you know, <laughs> and, and stuff. So it's, 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 it's actually very funny, you know, to, to work with these uh, kind of people. The last one we did in Basel, uh, it was uh, with the Swiss uh, uh, NGO that we work with. And, um, you know, we organized this workshop where we again uh, trained police from, from there, from Basel and from Zurich and from other, you know. And it's really interesting when, when you realize that these people should use the same open source tools, you know, because this is no secret here. I mean, these are all open. I mean, it's public, you know. The only power is that you can go country by country, you know, and you can index information. But a lot, lot of the law enforcement, lots of the people in the law enforcement don't know about this. 
So when we, for instance, trained police in Vilnius at some point on how to get company records from Cyprus, they were like, oh, but, you know, uh, I knew that we, it would take at least two months to get a, a company record from Cyprus. And we showed them how they can get the same record like in one minute, you know, paying 10 euros. Now, this being said, of course, they cannot use that information in court because all the information must be obtained through legal ways. But imagine this scenario where, you know, they file a request with Cyprus to get a company record. Cyprus responds after two months and sends the, the, the record to the police in Vilnius, you know. And the police there says, oh, sees, oh, but the company in Cyprus is owned by a company in Seychelles. And they file a new, you know, request with the Seychelles and so, and so on and so on. So what they can do, what we, what we taught them to do is that they can file everything at the same time. Once you know exactly that the company in Cyprus, you find in one minute the com company in Cyprus is owned by the company in the Seychelles, you file these requests at the same time. So you, you kind of shorten the time, like, hugely. Because, you know, the difference between criminals and law enforcement is that, you know, criminals are very quick and very smart. Law enforcement is confined to borders and stuff. Us, on the other side, as journalists, we are not confined to borders. We can do our research very, very quickly. We don't have to show the, uh, you know, our proofs to a judge. Our judge is the public. And if we do our work right, you know, we, uh, the public will be convinced, uh, you know, and, and such. No. Um, okay, any, please. Shipping records uh, and customs declarations part of the investigative dashboard, and do you have any advice on, on how to track that? Um, well, we do have some shipping databases indexed, um, but I would really recommend you, I mean, uh, if you're interested in shipping, um, there's a great reporter, uh, her name is Janina Senini, and Janina is, is an expert exactly into, you know, tracking down ship, uh, ships and, and stuff uh, and stuff like this. I actually just wrote her, asking her for help on, on, on a shipping issue. Uh, so I think Janina Senini, and I actually have a PowerPoint made by her, so I can, you know, because it's, it's, it's a very long PowerPoint, with what kind of database to use to track down ships, to track down, you know, all sorts of planes and, uh, and other stuff. Those are very, very useful, and indeed, I mean, combined with company searches, combined with other, you know, again, you, you create something uh, that can can be turned into um, really good investigative reporting. Yeah. Yes. What kind of information we could get? Like, uh, it's only the name of the companies, uh, name of person who own in the address, or also another information like bank account transaction or properties. Yes. Uh, yes. So, if if you uh, so you have three options here. You see, Identi identify what a person owns. So that means you know you give us a name and we search that name across databases, international, local databases, and such. And the second one is the determine company ownership. And here you know you put the name of the company and we'll give you all the records that are available on that company. And in many cases we'll use our network to get the offline records as well for you, which is really really cool, you know, and useful. So we'll get you everything that we can. Now, if you ask us, you know, for companies in BBI, you know, we won't be able to give you who's really behind those companies. What we'll be able to give you is the actual, the official record. We'll pay $50 uh, to get you that. Sometimes, but very rarely, I, th I say that in 10% of the cases, we actually got names from BBI, actual names of people that they filed in error or because there was a lawyer that was overzealous or something, something happened there. But in some cases, so it's still worth going for those records because sometimes they can yield amazing results. Uh, but that's like uh, if you're actually lucky. That happens, it, it's, it's the same in many, many countries. So it's worth getting them, but you don't always know what you get. You know that you'll get at least, <coughs> you know, uh, some records, you know, but sometimes you can get more than, you know, than that, yeah. To get the answer after request uh, the data. So uh, you'll see, if you create an account here and you ask for some information, uh, you'll see that you'll get in touch with a researcher. Uh, that means there's going to be a text box, you know, where the researcher is going to tell you, okay, so look, I got for you the Cyprus records, but I, I found out that uh, from the Cyprus records that the company is owned by a company in Delaware. So it's going to take me another day to get you the, com uh, the, the, the those records from there. And then it goes on and on. So it depends on how deep the research. I mean, sometimes we even identified schemes that, you know, consisted of 18 layers of companies, you know. 
Uh, so in some of those places you have to still have to wire the money via a bank account and you wait for a week to get the information or you know in some other cases because our researchers have good relationships with those people at those registries it's quicker you know but it really depends if it's if it's a, just a simple company record will get you you know uh, very very quickly <coughs> and of course all these searches mean global and all this you'll get them you, you'll get you know what we found you know um, let's see maybe mr timish loaded up okay <laughs> you see so in this case, you see, you know, the companies that he's involved with, the previous uh, companies, and underneath here, as I mentioned, you know, the, the diagram of the connections, you know, and the level of connection. So you'll also get this, that you can use yourself for your own research, but we never advise you to use this record in your reporting, because this is not the original record. This is just, you know, it's an index of the information, and it can be wrong, you know. Because there's someone inputting the information and maybe they got some names wrong and uh, all that. So it's always, I mean, uh, we're checking. But uh, time-wise, you know, it's pretty quick. But again, depends. If we're dealing with, you know, lots of companies and then maybe our researchers will find, uh, find out, uh, you know, court cases in certain countries. And with those, you have to file a request with the court. And it's court by court. Some courts will give you the information instantly. Uh, some courts will make you wait, you know, for, for a long time. Sometimes you have to f uh, file some... Uh, uh, other type of requests with various uh, officials. So depends, depends. But if you want a straight record from a database, that's that's easy. You know, that's uh, that's probably a, a few days. Depends again on the amount of research that we have to do, uh, and we usually have have a lot of re uh, research to do. I mean, right now I think there are about uh, uh, more than 500 tickets open. So that's 500 journalists asking for information. You know, and that some of that is you know it's a lot of uh, information. Uh, so it depends. Yeah. How many researchers do you have to figure out uh, to answer all of the requests? How many researchers? Uh, very few. Um, actually, so right now we have eight okay. researchers, uh, which is very very few. You know, we we need mo uh, many more, and that's one one idea. So I'm going to meetings with librarians. You know, there are research librarians. You know, in many schools in the world. You know. That are people that have access to all these databases, to mean global Lexis Nexis, because they they based on uh, you know at uh, schools of business and, and such Harvard School of School of Business Stanford School of Business, and these people are amazing in what they do. You know they, this is what they're good good at. You know they research databases. So I'm trying to convince some of these people you know to donate a bit of their time to help investigative reporters worldwide. You know. And they can brag in the evening, you know, hey, I helped that guy from Nepal, you know, and he took down the government, you know, and stuff. So the idea is to, to, to actually tap into the, these resources as well. And I'm going to these meetings, and we have right now a few researchers that uh, uh, help us, you know, without pay, basically, because we can't pay them, you know. But these, these are people with access to databases, and, you know, we only ask, you know, for 15 minutes a day for, of their time, actually, you know, so. Nadia, but I'm a, a reporter for investigative journalism. I just want to ask, the investigation dashboard is a platform to search in uh, its own database already collected, or also to uh, go through Google or other resources each time it uh, see the request. So I mean, in limited database, if you didn't find the person or the company in this database, you answer no, or you still digging in other resources? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the idea is that this is a, a growing database. So when you search, you search over the most current data in the investigative dashboard. So the investigative dashboard has, as I mentioned before, these scrapers. Uh, some are uh, go daily, you know, to websites, databases to scrape them and to bring in new information. So every day the investigative dashboard is different. It's, it's improved, so it, it gets fresh data. But yes, it only searches across the data that is indexed by the investigative dashboard and by open corporates. Yeah. And if you're from Arij, uh, you should talk to uh, Mahmoud, Mahmoud Al Mahmoud, who I know. Uh, I mean, he's uh, he's a very good friend of Rana as well. So he's our ID researcher from the Arij side. So we actually have a person with your uh, with with Arij that but works. I'm working with Hamoud as the researcher. He oh. uh, he forwarded the request for me and I did it. Oh, okay. I'm talking with Leila always. Leila from OCCRP. Yes, of course, of yes. course. I hired Leila. Yeah. Yes, but I just uh, this. Uh, a question crossed my mind just now. Mm -hmm. 
And I want to comment on one thing. Uh, almost OCCRP forward to us a request about UAE, Dubai, and Abu Dhabi. But uh, we as a manual researcher have a few uh, resources in Dubai and journalists. And OCCRB have a reach to cross border uh, for this. So can we uh, find other uh, resources or how we can solve this problem of Dubai, of, of UAE? Yes, uh, some places are really, really hard. I mean, Dubai, uh, you can get some, uh, some information from the, uh, from the uh, FTZ, right? From the free, uh, free trade zone, but there are many other uh, areas in Dubai that you can't. So, I mean, again, uh, ideally, you'd find someone, a local researcher there that we, we previously worked with lawyers in Dubai that were able to get some information because, I mean, Dubai and all these uh, Arab countries are kind of hard when it, when it comes to uh, obtaining information. Um, this being said, we'll actually publish till the end of the year, and uh, Hamoud Al Mahmoud wrote a chapter in this Follow the Money Handbook. So this is going to cover the Arab world as well and how to get information country by country in the Arab world. You know, it, it, it covers the world, but it also has chapters written by uh, her, her colleague you know, on how to deal with Arab countries. It's, it's hard. Uh, African countries are very, very hard. China, except for Hong Kong, uh, it's, it's very hard for us. Um, so we get some information, but we always, uh, always have to go sideways you know, and uh, to, to look information up. Uh, so we need to, to uh, better our research in, in quite a few regions of the world, but I'm really hoping that you could help us with Dubai and I mean in terms of resources We got the money, you know to pay for research and all that But we need you know to uh, to probably get to scraping some of those databases there and or to get to do to do something, you know Yeah, yeah. Can I just quickly ask about how information is in terms of reaching in Southeast Asia? Uh, South, Southeast Asia is, uh, is bad. I mean, uh, we have, um, you know, I mean, we can easily get information from, as I mentioned before, in places like Hong Kong, you know. Um, some information from Singapore, but right now I, I, I get it that the law changed, right? So you have to be a local, based or to have a permit uh, there so to, to access this information. So. It, Yeah, the uh, the law changed so that um, basically you can you can get the re the corporate registry. They still have to file the documents, and you can still get them, but you need to have a um, a residence pass code number to actually do the search in the first place. So or to get the documents. So um, it's like a it's called the Sing Pass. You can't get past that without the Sing Pass. <laughs> so um, I have that though. So just uh, give me a shout if you want to the company Singapore companies. That's probably the, the easiest way. <laughs> but then, mm -hmm. quite a bit of information from sou Southeast Asia is indexed by Orbis or Mint Global. I don't know how they do it exactly, but you know, quite a bit of it is indexed. So at least you find out that there is a company there owned by this guy, and then maybe you go. You yeah, I, th I think you can do the original search. Uh, you can find out that the company is there. You, you just can't get the documents filed by the company, which would be available if you were Singaporean or had a residence pass. So. Uh, yeah. And in, in, in some places, you know, uh, there's no centralized way to get in information, you know. Uh, so you have to go to the regions, like uh, uh, a registry of companies, you know. And there is where we use actually the, the network. We don't do just these online searches, but we use people, you know, that know how to get information. Um, we did a project, you know, on narco uh, traffickers, you know, in Mexico. I hired, you know, people there to work, work on this project where we mapped, you know, the assets of these narco traffickers. And, you know, we were, I mean, we had to get company records from various parts of Mexico, but that's, you know, that's really insane in some, I mean, if you go to northern Mexico, where the cartels are really powerful, you can't, uh, can't just uh, send a journalist to, you know, the uh, register of companies to ask for data on this name, you know, that belongs to a trafficker, you know, uh, to a narco, because that person will get killed, the, the, the journalist. So in some cases, you know, you have to be creative and to use actually the tools that criminals are using, like proxies. So you would use lawyers, you know, to get the data and you disguise the data in a bigger batch of data. So you're only interested in this company, but you ask for these 10 companies, you know, in, in, in exchange. But a lot of, of, of the research, you know, when it comes to places where you can't really get the information, is done outside of those countries. And that's because, I, especially when you're investigating organized crime and corruption, there's almost no case of high-level organized crime or corruption that involves just one country, you know. 
So if you can't get the, the information from Malaysia, you know, on the big theft that happened there, you know, with the one billion, you know, you'll probably be able to get some information about uh, the companies involved and, and such, you know, from outside, you know, from the outside, and then maybe try to get something locally through sources, you know, and other investigative reporting means. Yeah. So this being said, we need to, you know, to to work here and to uh, to actually cover better, you know, Southeast Asia and other regions. Yeah. Any, any other question? Okay, so then uh, thank you very much. Uh, my email is paul at OCCRP.org. So if you want to yeah, get in touch with me, cheers.